Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Michelle Karoulis, Director of Community Engagement here at Counseling at Northwestern. We are very excited to present a special Grand Rounds to you today in recognition of Juneteenth. Please join me in welcoming our special guests, John Mills, Dr. Tanya Davis, and Dr. Keisha Birch. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karoulis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the recognition of Juneteenth, and thank you for joining us today. I've been given the distinct honor of introducing Mr. John Mills. Mr. Mills is originally from San Diego and is a technologist by trade, but a genealogist and equity advocate by passion. Mr. Mills is a descendant of both Southern and Northern enslaved people, as well as the descendant of slaveholders due to their relationship with enslaved females. Mr. Mills is intentional about unearthing the stories of people who are little known and sharing how their experiences relate to this country's history pertaining to the system of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Mr. Mills's goal is to honor the forgotten as well as to apply critical thinking to our history as a means to find solutions to the many ripple effects that impact us today. And so with that, and without further ado, I present to you, Mr. John Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mills. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. This is, um, it's, uh, um, it is definitely um, an honor to be able to present for, for Northwestern. Um, and this information, as I was telling you guys before, is like really fascinating to me. So, but, but whenever anybody wants to listen to it, I'm, uh, I am obliged, I'll, I'll come talk about it because it's, um, again, it's a passion of mine. I'm gonna share um, a deck that I prepared. So let me, let me get that going. And um, it, it, it standardly is a much large, larger lecture that I'm gonna try to trim down. So I'll try to stay on message and on point. I'll try not to drift um, as much as I can. Um, to tell a little bit about me, um, um, as, as you stated, I'm originally from San Diego, California, um, and uh, I moved to Connecticut, which is where I live now. Back in 1998, I brought my, um, my wife and my children with me, um, who are all adults now. They're all grown and moved out. Um, I'm a technologist, you know, a, a software architect by, by trade. Um, but I, I tend to not uh, align myself to that. I think I identify more with regards to my, you know, my role within my family lineage as a husband, father, grandfather. And so I tend to kind of highlight that, which is why I, I, I align that on the slide. Um, in my youth, and which kind of gets into the story that I tend to tell and how I got into genealogy and got into equity advocacy, um, in my youth, I had what I describe as an unconscious belief of a lesser value based on my own skin color. Now, I didn't come to that conclusion in my youth. Like I, that took me many years to recognize that in, a, in, in the past, that was something that, that I had, right? Like I was, I was, it was into the nineties and um, I'd had a, my daughter had been born and I was in corporate America and I was starting to be much more conscious of my own unconscious biases and really conscious of those that were occurring around me, which then had me analyze the effects of things that I had seen years prior, but didn't align to them, which made me realize that I was just kind of accepting um, uh, a lesser kind of value in myself. And I decided I didn't want to perpetuate that. You know, I. I now had a daughter, like I wanted to figure out how to stop my daughter from thinking in the same way I had come to at that point in the 90s. Um, what was also really odd for it for me is that I, um, you know, growing up in the 70s in California, there was a lot that was going on right around the time I was born. Um, you know, seven years prior, Medgar Evers had been, been killed and just a few years prior, Malcolm X had been killed and just a year prior, Dr. King had been killed. And at the time, Ali was fighting going to um, Vietnam and that was in the courts. And um, my father had associations with the Panthers and the US organization. And so it was just a lot happening around that time, which made my father very um, um, 
direct about my value. He was really clear about my skin color and my hair texture and about how all of that was value. He preached it and tried to push it into our heads. So for me to come to this epiphany and conclusion in the 90s that I was kind of rolling with an expectation that I had lesser value was a confl conflict in my mind. It was like, how did that happen when my father was like that? And now I'm realizing I was accepting this, right? Like, wh where did that come from? Um, so it, it made it me more adamant about trying to like not, how do I correct that with my daughter? Um, I thought that my father's strategy must not have been all that, uh, there must, we must need something else to go along with that because you know, of where I ended. Um, and so I started trying to outwardly project something, which I laugh about now because it was like my own biases coming out, like projecting to the world what I saw as the expectation that they had of me. Right. So in corporate America, um, at the time, I traveled a lot and I would meet up in different cities with um, um, three different uh, white women colleagues that were from different towns, different cities. And we would do work in a town and then travel back to our home state. And a couple of weeks later, we'd travel to another city. And that's what we would do. And the O.J. Simpson trial was going on at the time. And I had been trying to exemplify the strategy of uh, being as, as least um, as amenable and least threatening as possible as a means to project something that would get their minds to look at me and anyone looked like me differently. Like that was like an outward like strategy that I was trying to project. Um, so we're in the city, we're in Ohio at the time. We all traveled there and we're in the lunchroom and OJ Simpson trials on on the television. And they ask me a question that I assumed the answer they wanted. They said, John, what do you think? What do you think about the trial? And I thought, you know, there was a lot of contention back then with regards to black America, white America, who was guilty, who wasn't. And I thought they wanted me to hear me say he was guilty. So I, don't, I said, I don't know, he's probably guilty. Come to trying to be amenable to them. And uh, the response back I got was, um, see, that's why we like you. And I translated that into this effort that I was putting forth to be so amenable as a means to like change perspective. My translation was, it was just making me an outlier. And I didn't, I wasn't really affecting anything, which left me back to my father's strategy. I just went back to just, well, let's stick to home. Let me just try to it, you know, grill into my daughter's head, her value and her skin color and her hair. And I did that until around 2002. And in 2002, um, I moved, I had a move to Connecticut. My sister had also moved to Connecticut. And um, she, oh, I'm sorry, she, she had moved to the East Coast, she had moved to Virginia. And she had been doing genealogical research in California. And so she came to the East Coast, still doing the same thing. Um, and we're both away from home. And I'm trying to like, find some sense of home, we're on the East Coast. So I start working with her on this genealogical research that she started. And I was in technology, so I started building a website for her and presenting the information. So she had to send it to me. So I would get to, I would read it before I pu put, published it and created pages for it. Um, and I started learning some fascinating stuff. Before I short share all of that with you, I'll kind of talk to like what I knew at the time about my own genealogy. What I knew was my mother was a child of an immigrant, but I had no idea where my grandmother was from. I knew my, my mother's father was a Navy man uh, and he was born in Baltimore. Um, that's about all I knew. I knew nothing, very little about his mother, parents, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, very little. My father, I knew his father was from Texas. Um, I, I had no clue how they got to California. Um, I thought I had Native American DNA. I don't know where I got that from. Somebody along the line must have told me that, but I, I had no clue why I thought that, but that's what I thought. And I assumed some of my answers was, were slaves, but it was just an assumption. No one had ever given me that information. I assumed, you know, I'm an American and I'm an African-American. It must be some line to slavery, but maybe it's not. I didn't really know. So that's what I knew. Um, my sister starts sending me information. The first thing she sent me um, was lineage relative to my father's father. And I knew him very well. He died in 1987. 
He rarely talked about his, I didn't know he had brothers and sisters. He rarely talked about his family, never talked about his parents. So I knew nothing about him when he passed you know, beyond he came here from Texas. What my sister found was his parents were named Robert Mills and Eliza Mills. And they were both, they both died in, in Henderson, Texas. And Robert's parents' names were Ned and Eliza. And she sent me census documents. And I can see Ned in an 1870 census, but we couldn't find him prior to that. And she, she explained to me, well, he was a slave. And so they wouldn't be in a census. So, and I, that fascinated me and kind of taught me that, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I am a descendant of a slave. Um, and it also resonated with me that, wait a minute, my Mills is just the last slave owned Holder's last name. So that struck me, right? I had grown so you know, fascinated with like, a DNA kind of visceral relationship with my last name. And that was a gotcha of that was your slaveholders last name. Um, so she also presented me with documentation relative to my great grandmother, Eliza. And that fascinated me and fascinated me. It showed uh, she had her birth certificate that she had acquired. At the time, it was a little more difficult to get a birth certificate. You had to purchase it and mail away for it. But now in these days, I think on Ancestry, you can just kind of look this stuff up. But she had bought it, got it back. And it showed that she had died in October 28th, 1918 of Spanish influenza. And I went, wait a minute, I know that one. That's the 1918 flu pandemic. Wait a minute, she died of the flu pandemic? And so she said, yeah, that's what the, the death certificate says. Um, and she had a picture of her, which completely, I'd never seen anything like that. So um, she said, John, it says on the death certificate that she's buried at Hickory Grove Cemetery in Henderson, Texas. So I was like, well, we gotta go there. And, and it, um, relative to genealogy, a lot of times I learned with African-American kind of genealogy, you find information in other places other than just kind of government-based documentation. You, a lot of times you have to go to cemeteries and who's buried there and their names kind of drive you in directions. So that was our thought. We're gonna go to Henderson, go to the cemetery and we're gonna find some stuff out, right? So we planned this trip, we get to Henderson, Texas and we get to Hickory Grove Cemetery and it's a bright summer day and there's a church on the property and the cemetery is beautiful and it's well-groomed. And we're, th we're like, this is fascinating. So we start walking through the cemetery. We can't find anyone we know, no one related to us. Um, but then we saw a lightly driven kind of path in the grass along the side of the cemetery gate. So we decided to walk that and it led us into the woods, which there behind the cemetery is where we then started to discover names that we knew that I was now listing on this tree, on this website that I was you know, providing for my my sister at the time. And so we were stepping over down trees and, you know, there were broken stones and markers that were rusted out. And, you know, it just, we couldn't really read much, but here and there we'd find a relative. We never found my great grandparents, Eliza and Robert. Um, so we left there a little disappointed. We came back just this year in, in April. And we, we came back in April because in 2016, a retired police officer, went to that cemetery, uh, had some folks clean it up a little bit, and he found my great grandparents. And he, con he found me and my sister contact us and told us they are there and gave us pictures of their markers, which he couldn't read much on them. They were all rusted, but they, he showed us what they looked like. So we went back in 2022, just a few months ago, um, to see if we can find them. But it took us six years since he sent us that note. So now it's all the winters, all the leaf fall, all this, they're back covered up again. So we're going back in October with a crew to kind of rake through that property um, behind the, the main cemetery to see if we can find them. Um, he, uh, we, my sister then presented um, information on my father's mother. Cause so we're going down these various lines of my grandparents. So now we're looking at my father's mother and um, uh, uh, and her, her lineage was interesting in that um, I knew my grandmother, she died in 1998, and I knew her mother. Um, her name was Tony Lee Kyle, and she, I was a teenager when she passed, so I knew them both well. But I, again, I knew very little about anything beyond them. What we learned is um, my great grandmother, Tony Lee Kyle, again, whom I knew, her parents were John Kyle and Mary White. Mary White was very fair skinned. And so was my grandmother and great grandmother. And so was my father of whom you'll see on the next slide of which I spent my whole life thinking it was Native American blood, right? 
And so what I learned about Mary White is her parents were an Irishman by the name of John White and a slave that he purchased by the name of Marguerite. And John White was married to a woman named Kasia White, um, but they purchased Marguerite as a housemaid. And then he actually used her uh, uh, for his enjoyment as well, which is how my, uh, my great, great grandmother, Mary White came to be. And so we learned off of this that it, the fair skin in that side of our family and my father came from that, right? It's, it's Irish, um, which is uh, unbelievable to me. I didn't know that. Um, my my uh, sister also then chased down my uh, great grandmother's father, John Kyle. And we learned that his parents were Sam and Vinnie Kyle. And all three of them, John Kyle, Sam Kyle, Vinnie Kyle were all owned by the Kyle family in Henderson in, um, in Texas. And um, so we went there to, to check out Kyle while we were there earlier this year. And what we learned is uh, Claiborne Kyle, who owned them, was a, a, a senator in Texas. He was a senator in Mississippi. He was a Texas House of Representatives member. Um, the town is named after his son. Um, so we had to go to Kyle, Texas to find all this stuff. Um, the, the stadium where Texas A&M plays is named after him. It's, Kyle Stadium uh, or, or Kyle Field. Um, and that's my father in the middle. Again, I've spent my whole life not knowing why he had such fair skin and I was learning it now. Claiborne Kyle also had relationships with his, his uh, slaves, which, uh, which again, we, we had that kind of this Irish and um, um, uh, 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 Norwegian blood coming like from multiple kind of angles. Um, uh, so we, we also learned that, uh, Claiborne Kyle had five sons uh, with his, his, his wife. They all fought in the Civil War in the Confederacy. So, and so we, we have like this DNA relationship to these soldiers in the Confederacy. Again, all kind of fascinating to me as well. We wanted to go see their cemetery as well. Again, genealogy is a, a lot of times it's about going to the cemeteries and getting information. So we went to the Kyle family cemetery in Kyle, Texas, and we found Claiborne Kyle uh, you see a tree line behind me, and that tree line is where I, we found our descendants. So in the main cemetery, you won't find them, but again, similar to the other line of my family, if we walked into the woods behind the cemetery, we would find some descendants, some we wouldn't find, some didn't have stones, some stones were worn and broken. Um, so that, that was, it was becoming a theme, right? It was, uh, which was fascinating, but it was, it was also disheartening. Um, we then shifted to my mother's family. And uh, so that was my father's family. We shifted to my mother's family. Uh, and we started with my grandfather and um, on my mother's side, who again, whom I knew very well. He died in 2007. And he was a hard and fast military man, Navy man, all my life. I, I mean, I literally, at five years old, he was like saluting me when I'd come into a room. Like he was hardcore naval man. But I, he also talked similar to all of my grandparents, they talked very little about um, the history of their family. I knew very little about it. Um, and so as my, my sister found information, it was fascinating. What we found about him was um, uh, his great grandparents, so it would be my third great, um, his, his great grandfather, his name was William Cooper. And he was also in the Navy. He was in the Union Navy which fascinated me in that I wish we had known that while my grandfather was alive, because I don't think he knew that. Given that he was such a hard naval man, I'm sure he would have found delight in that. But um, we discovered he was, a, we was in, he was in the Civil War as well, and he was on three separate ships in the Civil War, one of which was a Confederate ship that was captured and redeployed as a Union ship. And we were able to find documentation of where he had uh, applied for his pension. And then once he died in 1909, we found documentation um, of where his, his wife, his widow was trying to get his, 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 his pension and struggling to get it. Um, so we, we had all this documentation. We also found where he was buried. He was buried at a cemetery called Laurel Cemetery in Baltimore. So we were like, we're going to Laurel Cemetery. So we start researching Laurel Cemetery and we go to Baltimore and what we discover is that was a cemetery in the early 1800s that was used by um, uh, uh, affluent white Americans and it's where they would bury their, their servants. And um, by 1858, it turned into a cemetery 
that was just any African-American of Baltimore, that's where they buried their descendants. So it's just a black cemetery. Um, and, um, but by the late 1950s, um, so now we're, we're, you know, 100 years later, but in the late 1950s, it, they had financial issues. The city decided um, that they, you know, they did want to turn it into something else. So they paved over it. They told the families that they moved the bodies to a cemetery 200 miles away. The families complained that how are we going to see our loved ones? They're 200 miles away. But they still kind of just um, paved over it. And years later, as trees would fall in, on the sides of the property, like bones would be sticking up out of the earth, which is how the, the, the townspeople realized that they never uh, removed the bodies. So um, a couple of universities started analyzing the property and they started doing surveys, uh, ground penetrating surveys, and they estimate that there's somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 bodies buried underneath that, that parking lot. So, we just took a picture in the parking lot. That's where my uh, third great grandfather, uh, William Cooper lies. And we're now working with Loudoun Cemetery, which um, is a, a federal cemetery in Baltimore to at least get a stone place there that we can then have information about who he was. So if, who comes, if someone comes behind us doing similar research, at least they will you know, get some information. Um, so, so far three of the four grandparent lines kind of led to, um, information that we we kind of got stuck even at the cemetery so so in the, in the census we had to we were stuck and now at the cemeteries we were stuck so you know we had one left one less last less last grandparent left and that was my mother's mother um, um but we knew she was an immigrant but i didn't know from where i knew growing up she had an accent i didn't know what the accent was she was just my grandmother that was that was just normal for me i never questioned it she never talked about what it was i knew she made foods that were not um, standard to the other side of my family and i didn't know anyone around me that made those foods they were different um, but i i never questioned i didn't i it, it was just normal to me uh, but now as an adult as we're doing this research it all came to, to, to truth. Um, uh, all of her descendants that we were able to find all lived in either Portland Township, Jamaica or Yalis, Jamaica, which is where we then, oh, grandma was Jamaican. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, at the time I'm like 40 years old and just realizing my grandmother was Jamaican. <laughs> um, so uh, we were also able to find uh, a, a um, as I said, my grandfather was a naval man. We were able to find an identification card of hers that my grandfather applied for her to get on the Coco Solo base in the canal zone in, um, um, in Panama back in the uh, 40s and 50s. So um, it just confirmed to us that ID card. It said citizenship Jamaican. And so that just confirmed it for us. But we have not been able to go any further back with her. We're still working that angle. Um, so what all this told me was that um, as a part of its genealogy work, we also did our DNA, you know, we, our tests. What it all told me is that I had like this uh, amazing tie to every area and every corner of like the triangular trade, right? Like the, my, in my DNA, like 86% of it was from that slave coast, that West coast of Africa. The other 14% was some European country, whether it be Norway or Ireland. And those were things that we were finding out anyway, when we were finding these people. And then my grandmother was from Jamaica, which of course, you know, there were um, an abundance of slaves sent there. Um, and so that tied us to that element of the triangular trade. So I, it, I don't, I'm, for me, it gave me a sense of um, knowing who I was, if that makes any sense. Like I started to really be clear that I was ingrained in this nation in a different way than I previously realized. And it, it gave me a, a level of pride in my people. And it also started to explain to me things about my um, ancestors, the ones I knew and who they were. Um, and this slide, I probably can just kind of run past it, but there's a long list of things in here that, it, you know, in the details of it that it told me, um, you know, my, my, my relationship to the West Indies and to the slave trade and to Europe and to the Civil War, both sides. I had people who were in the Civil War and the, you know, the Union and on the Confederate side, um, to Southern slavery. I had relations, you know, descendants from slaveholders to the 1918 pandemic. 
to the migration of African Americans from the South to the West and North, the great migration between 1910, 1920 through 1970, like both my father's parents, that's what happened with them. Like I saw all these historical ties in my lineage. Um, I started to see like the confusion created by surnames, how all these surnames, Kyle and Mills, surnames that I, I, I held this honor behind had like a cap at like my slaveholder. Like it, it just, it just it was a completely different um, it, picture it painted in my mind. Um, learning about segregation in life and death. Like I didn't know, I just didn't know anything about that. And then the lack of markers, lost cemeteries and the entire scope of this, I was never taught in school, right? So, um, so yeah, learning that such a, a, a recent tie to slavery um, and the impacts to my ancestors, I was also able to tie it to like things I knew about, like inequities around wealth and incarceration rates and health. Like I was starting to like see those places in my own family and like seeing these stories. And again, the, the, the most uh, impactful thing was I knew my grandfather. I knew my, both of them. I knew my great grandmother and I knew things about them that they di I didn't make sense to me when they were alive, but made a lot of sense to me once I learned all of this, right? Um, so that, which tells you a lot about your parents and how they raised you, which then gives you a completely different sense of, of the world. Um, it helped me with my own unconscious biases. And I thought maybe if I started advocating or just at least just telling those stories, maybe other people would come to the same place, right? And so around 2017, I'll say, I just started telling these stories. And um, they started with the stories of my family, but they, it quickly went into stories that were outside of my family because around 2020, of course, the pandemic, we couldn't travel. I tended to travel, get information, then I tell the story, um, but I couldn't do that. So now I had to find things around Connecticut and I'm, I live in Connecticut and I didn't know anything about stories like this in Connecticut, but I thought I would start doing some research. I started just kind of searching on the internet and I ran into this individual by the name of Prince Mortimer. Um, he was a slave uh, in the 1700s. I came across him in a book that was written by a gentleman by the name of Richard Phelps. In, in, uh, he wrote the book in 1844. And the book only has a small paragraph about this individual. It's, the book isn't about Prince Mortimer. The book is about a prison in a town in Connecticut. And, and it just has blurbs in there about some of its past residents and Prince Mortimer happened to be one of them. And the interesting part about the story in this small paragraph about this, this one individual, it said he was a, a native of Guinea, trapped, brought to this country, um, um, uh, died in Weathersfield, which was a prison. So he was in prison when he died at 110 years old, um, which fascinated me. I was like, how he lived to be 110 with all the struggle and strife of the time. He lived to be 110, which struck me. Um, it talked about um, uh, how he went to prison. The small paragraph talked about he attempted to poison his owner. And, and at, at, a, at a latter age, in 1811, he's like 87 years old. And I'm going, how does he spend 80 years of life as a slave? And then at 87, that's when he decides to like attempt to free himself. And so it just was a fascinating story, what I could read from it. So I wanted to know more. I, I figured this must be a movie. There must be a bunch of other books on this. It also, also references in there that he was a servant to many officers in the Revolutionary War, one of which was George Washington. And so to me, I just thought this has got to be a movie, right? So I, I start hunting. I can find no other documentation of, on him other than this one par paragraph in this one book from 1844 until 2006. And so no one else writes about it. Until 2006, one individual a guy by, um, by the name of Dennis Karen, who, who I know, I, I've met him, he lives in a, a local town. He decides to write a broader story because of the lack of information, right? He's like, I gotta tell this guy's story because this is fascinating. I just read this book uh, and it had this one paragraph. That's all that's there. Like he had the same impression of me uh, that I got. So he writes this book. Um, in the book, um, he covers 
more detail to the story of how this individual went to prison in looking at court documentation, right? He gets more information. Um, and he get, looks at city documentation of the town here in Connecticut where his owner was from. His owner with name was Philip Mortimer. He was an Irishman who moved to the country in the 1740s. He comes to, in, through Boston. Um, he's, he's already wealthy, and, but he wants to figure out how to expand on his wealth. He, he, discover, he, he, wants, he wants to start a rope making business but in Boston, he, too much competition. He learns that in Connecticut, there's this town called Middletown where they make ships, but there's nobody in the town that makes rope for the sails. So he moves to Connecticut with his wife, um, Martha, and he builds this rope walk, which is a, 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 a building for the purpose of making rope for ships. And he needs slaves, so he purchases a bunch of slaves, one of which is this individual, Prince Mortimer. And it was Prince Mortimer's job as a spinner in this business to make these ropes. And his plan worked. It, I mean, he became extremely wealthy, more wealthy than he already was in this small town of shipbuilders. Um, and uh, so by the mid 1770s, the Revolutionary War well, in, well into play, uh, according to the 1844 book, Prince goes off to the Revolutionary War. Um, he's at Valley Forge. He comes back. He's still enslaved. Um, by 1792, the owner, Philip Mortimer, writes a will. And he, in that will, he gives a lot of his uh, property or some of his property and, and, and valuables to two slaves in the house other than Prince, uh, two Mar a married couple named Jack and Sophie. So those, their, their names will come back up. But he gives this property to Jack and Sophie. Um, but for, for Prince, he didn't want his business to go down when he died. So in, in the, in the uh, will, it says he'll be freed three years after, after the, the owner's death, Philip Mortimer's death. And um, I was thrown by all that. So I'm already fascinated in the story. I'm reading this book. I'm fascinated. By 1793, he updates, he adds an addendum to the will, another new codicil, and the new codicil says, I want to give more property to Jack and Sophie, these two other individual slaves in his household. Doesn't update the section with regards to Prince. Prince is gonna still remain enslaved um, for three years post his death. In 1794, he has a change of heart. He rewrites his entire will, but it's basically verbatim. The only real line he changed, one and another, was instead of saying in the will, um, Prince is to be freed three years after my death, he changed it to say, Prince is freed on my death. It's hard to read. This is an actual copy of that will that I was able to acquire. So, so don't struggle to read it. But the first one is, is, the idea, is the sentence in that will causing him to stay enslaved. The bottom section was the rewrite in 1794. He dies two days after he writes his will. Now he had one daughter. She was married, her name was uh, Anne. She was married. He was. She was married to a gentleman by the name of George Starr. George Starr um, didn't like that will for a couple of reasons. There's property that would have went to his wife, had it just all kind of went lineage wise, and at, back in that day, that just meant that it was the husband's. And um, in the will, Philip Mortimer made it clear that this property is not only to go to my daughter, but subsequent to her death, it's to go to my grandkids which essentially made it so that George Starr, his son-in-law, couldn't do anything with it. He couldn't sell it out because it had to go to these grandkids based on the will. And so he was upset about that. So once Philip Mortimer died, George Starr contests the will. And because of, he was able to prove issues with um, witnesses, the court uphold, uh, overturns the will. So Prince Mortimer, who at the time had been enslaved all these years, been, you know, assumedly was supposed to be freed from slavery after the revolution, was supposed to be freed after the death of his master. He's not because the will is overturned. And now he's the slave of George Starr, the son-in-law. Um, and he remains enslaved with George Starr um, from 1794 until 1811. So another 17 years. And in 1811, that's where this incident in that small paragraph in that first book of 1844 comes into play. That paragraph that he 
attempted to poison his master and was sent to prison for life. He, uh, one morning, George Starr gets up to drink his morning coffee of which Prince was providing to him. Prince is like 87 years old. He's working in the house serv serving breakfast. George Starr looks in the coffee. He sees some white clumps floating around. George claims that that's arsenic. He's trying to be poisoned, goes to the authorities. Prince is sentenced to life in prison in 1811. Um, so, that's as much as I knew at that point based on the second book. Um, but I also knew that Prince was buried at this Weathersfield prison cemetery, right? So I had a lot of things I wanted to do from a homework perspective. Now, I like wanted to see, well, what does his marker look like? Similar to my family, I, I wanted to go see the marker. What does his marker look like? Is that prison still there? Do they have a section for that cemetery? Right, I wanted to see that. And I wanted to see the documents that this writer used in coming up with all this. So I go to the Connecticut State Library and I'm able to find the court jacket for this 1811 case where Prince Mortimer went to prison for life. And I don't, I'm not presenting what's in it, but basically it tells this story of George Starr and being poisoned by Prince and seeing the arsenic in the coffee because there's clumps and he wouldn't drink it. And, you know, it basically accuses him all that. And the outside of the jacket, of course, says state versus Prince Negro. Like it doesn't use Prince Mortimer. Like, that was like odd to me. I learned afterwards that like while enslaved, it was somewhat of a, uh, a dishonor to the owner if you use their surname. So while enslaved, they, you were, they just put Negro after your name, right? So the courts were state versus Prince Negro. Um, and the wording is guilty, Newgate for life. And the Newgate was the prison. And that was December 21st, 1811. While I'm looking at these documents, there's another one right behind it, which I found fascinating. It was state versus Jack Mortimer. Now remember, Jack Mortimer was the Jack and Sophie, the other individuals in the household that Philip Mortimer was given all this land and property. So I'm going, wait a minute, December 1811, this, this is the same time period. Why was there a case against Jack? The same time there was a case against Prince, right? So I read the internals of this Jack and, and it reads just like Prince's, except it's saying Jack is the instigator. Jack got the arsenic. Jack convinced Prince to put it in the chocolate. Jack is evil. Jack did this. Like it, it reads like it were cohorts, but the state decided not to prosecute. They only prosecuted one. So Prince goes to prison, Jack, they drop the case. So that was fascinating to me, but it, it, that's, that was an element I, I, I had to remember. 11 years later, the daughter and the son-in-law, George Starr, they pass, they die. Um, uh, the the, the son-in-law, George Starr, dies in 1821. Another jacket at the Connecticut State Library from that day, from 1822. And forgive me, I know it's difficult to read, no need to read it. But in 1822, Jack is sentenced to Newgate Prison as well. He had attempted to burn down one of those properties that had now been passed down to the granddaughter. You know, property that he was supposed to get in that original will in 1794. So now Jack is sent to the same prison where Prince is because he tries to burn down a property, which told a narrative to me. It was like Jack was upset originally. He was working with Prince. 11 years later, he's still upset. He tries to burn down this property. And now they're both at this Newgate prison together, right? Prince for life, Jack for five years, supposedly from 1822 to 1827. I then look up um, a prisoner list from 1825. I'm trying to find Jack in that prison. But in 1825, Jack's no longer there. The only person's there is Prince. So what I gathered from that is Jack dies. They were both old, right? I mean, they were really old at this point. So I, my assumption is he died while in prison, Prince was still alive. Um, and I also learned that um, Newgate prison, while it's in ruin, it's kind of in ruin, you can tour it still today. Um, but the cemetery of that prison was lost for years and, and they didn't put stones where they buried bodies. They just buried them and, you know, and there was nothing there to mark the bodies. And so years later, after the prison had long passed, since closed, um, every, the town lost the location of where it even existed. Um, and they discovered it in 2003, but now it's on private property, like someone's home. It's a part of their backyard, right? Where the cemetery is. So my assumption is that's where Jack is. Um, so, but I wanted to figure out, well, where is Prince? The book said he died in Weathersfield and Newgate Prison is in East Granby, like it's a different city. 
What I learned was in 1827, they shut down Newgate Prison and they moved all the prisoners to a new town in Wethersfield, Wethersfield Prison. So I was like, oh, I gotta go there. Um, but what I learned is that was torn down in, in uh, the late uh, 1960s. Now it's a park. It's uh, like football field, softball field, baseball diamond. Um, and there's a section in the back of it where there's a cemetery. Um, you can tell because there's an outline of where the walls would have been for the cemetery. And there's a marker there that the city had placed there to basically say, this used to be a prison. This location was the location of the prison cemetery. Um, there were two cemeteries. We lost one of them, but there were two. And there was a guy here that was a slave who went to jail for trying to poison his master. And that bugged me a little bit. I felt like the story of Prince Mortimer was such so much deeper than he was just a prisoner. And I felt like there wasn't a marker there that really told his story and it didn't honor him for the revolution. This is an extremely military town where this prison was. Um, and it didn't honor him for the fact that he was a part of the revolution. It didn't, I felt like it needed to tell a little more about his journey, his path and the things that I considered to be somewhat of crimes against him. And anyone passing this marker would just see it as he was a criminal. And I, I, was, I was disturbed by that. I, I then went and tried to find, well, where are these people that owned him? Where's Philip Mortimer? Where was the daughter, Anne? Where is, where is the son-in-law, George? And I found out there was this cemetery in that town where they are in Middletown. It's called Mortimer Cemetery. And I talked to the, the writer of that second book and he told me how to get the key. He was like, go to the firehouse, they have the key, you can get in. And so I went to that cemetery and there are very prominent stones for them, not only for them, but there are very prominent stones for their friends, right? They, they, let, they allowed their friends to be buried in, in their tombs. Um, and so abundance of their whole lineage I can find on the documentation. So there was just like the stark contrast, right? Like, like the Prince and Jack are lost in these places, similar to my family who are just lost in these places. But if I go to their holders, like I find an abundance of information, including uh, buried along with the, his original slaveholder was an individual by the name of John Easton, a name I kind of re remembered. I'd read his name somewhere and it, it came to me that his name was mentioned in a book called The Log Books by a woman by the name of Ann Farrow. And so I went back and reread that book and it was like, oh yeah, he was considered like really a ruthless kind of slave trader. He would like you know, sail to the West coast of Africa, capture slaves, sail to the Caribbean, sell them. He would then come back to Middletown where he lived, he had a farm, he would take cattle and crops, and then he would go back to the Caribbean and he would like double you know, the money by then selling the slaves and then selling them the food to feed the slaves, right? And you know, he was, he was you know, famous for being known as saying that like his, his demeanor was, if we aren't talking slave trading, then I don't wanna to talk to you, right? And that was an individual kind of buried in the same location very prominently with all these other individuals. So again, the context being that the stark contrast, right? And so I, I then, you know, started a mission to kind of get a stone placed in this location, uh, same as the stone I'm trying to get placed in East Texas for my great my gra great grandparents. Same as the stone I'm trying to get placed in Baltimore Loudon Cemetery for my uh, third great grandfather. I started a mission here to get a stone placed in this location or some type of marker for Prince Mortimer. Um, uh, and a potentially something that tells a better story about Jack Mortimer at Newgate Prison. I started working with the town, the local um, historical uh, society. Um, I started working with the, the, the National Depart uh, Daughters of the Revolution, an organization that highlights it's um, individuals that are part of the Revolutionary War. And everyone wanted to work me, with me and they were willing, you know, I had to kind of raise the money, but they were willing with exception to the, our local Daughters of the Revolution chapter. Like they, need, they wanted very specific lineage information and official documentation from the government that said Prince Mortimer was in the revolution. They did, wouldn't take the word of this book from 1844 and their requirements are more official, official uh, uh, lineage uh, or, or more official documentation that was in the revolution and lineage, uh, like a living descendant. And I didn't, neither of these books that I knew said anything about Prince ever having kids. So I started trying to appease this. Like I wanted to work to figure this out. So um, I started a campaign to like uh, 
try to get the daughter of the revolution to maybe change their, their requirements. I started that online. So I took pictures at the site of this, the cemetery and, and I started getting signatures. I started getting thousands of signatures, but I also started more research. I found that there was an in individual from Connecticut named Prince that they called Prince Negro that was around George Washington. And so I, I was like, here, I got it. I got this, here's the market, here it is. But there was another individual, but it said he was American Indian. So I knew it wasn't him. I, I had just one African-American. So I took that to the Daughters of the Revolution. They weren't comfortable with that. They was like, we need to get that individual that you can tie to the slave holder. And that, and, uh, that pretty much when I gave up, because I started realizing that there was an intentional kind of uh, uh, a non-effort to capture documentation. Yet now I'm being held to a standard of documentation today that I probably would never be able to appropriately appease, right? So, and, and there, was a, there, there was a conflict in that. Like I felt giving the hundred years of slavery of this individual, I thought we should just take the word of slave at this point, right? Um, but they didn't agree with that. And the, the historical society was still willing to work with me. So um, I kind of let the daughters of the revolution go. I did continue to like research lineage and I discovered on local church records that Prince actually did have kids and no one knew that. That's not in any other book. And I also was able to discover that his daughter married Jack Mortimer's son and they moved to New York. So I'm still chasing that down just for my own edification, but not to appease the daughter of the revolution. Um, I also, uh, in the Wesleyan University is in that town where he was enslaved. So I started talking to the African-American studies department of that town and I would speak to them and they started helping me do some research. And we were able to find some other things. We were able to find out that um, the granddaughter, Martha Mortimer, after Prince Mortimer died, after, I'm sorry, after uh, Jack Mortimer and his wife die, um, Jack dying in that first prison, she decides to will all that property that he was supposed to get in the original will to all of his kids. So I don't know if, you know, these, lineage, these, these generations removed now just kind of felt a sense of guilt or I don't know what it was, but she starts willing property in the exact kind of um, alignment of what was listed in that original will to their kids now that they had passed. Um, so anyway, um, I'm still kind of working the, the, the effort to get that marker placed at the Weathersfield prison. Again, the historical society, the city of Weathersfield have been extremely um, amenable and they're, they're willing to do it. I was able to raise the money to do it within like four hours. I started a GoFundMe and based on the couple of years of me kind of telling this story, I had like 71 donors just, you know, within four hours out for the money. And so within like an hour of them saying, John, you have to raise the money. I was able to go, okay, I got the money. What's next? So, <laughs> so um, uh, that, that's this, the GoFundMe. And so um, this October, we're going to be doing an unveiling of that new marker in, in Weathersfield, which will kind of take me full circle. Um, but again, I still, got, I still got work to do with my own family. I got, I got a success here, but, but we still got my, more work to do to get markers for, um, for my own family. Interesting story with regards to this also is that the marker isn't there yet. What's in this picture is what is just, it's all that's there now. It's just a, just a concrete plate that says, you know, there used to be a cemetery here. Um, but uh, every year um, around uh, Memorial Day, I go there and I place flowers um, and a, a, a flower stick with, my, with cards on it that tell Prince Mortimer's story and a flag as him being a veteran of the Revolutionary War. And this year after placing it, I, as normal, I came back a couple of weeks later to get the flowers because you know they, they will have withered away and I don't want you know that. Um, and so I, I'll come back and get them. As I was coming back, the, the flag was gone, the cards were gone, but the flowers were still there. So I was like, oh, wow, that's odd, but okay, let me take the flowers. And as I bent down to pick up the flowers, an older gentleman who was walking a trail there saw me and he stopped me. He said, don't take those. There's a card in there. And I was like, what? And there's no card in here. He's like, yeah, there was when I came by. And he goes, let me tell you a story that was on the card. And he proceeded to tell me the entire life story of Prince Mortimer. 
in fascination in what happened to him and his imprisonment and how he was in prison and how he's moved from Newgate to Wethersfield, which for me just reinforced to me why there does need, you know, a true, does need to be a true marker at that location, right? <laughs> Um, so I'll round it out at, at that. Um, that's been my experience. Again, I continue to look to these locations as a means to um, uh, ensure that we're acknowledging the, the, the sacrifice of some of these individuals and, and, and acknowledging who they were, right, and their importance. They were people. Um, and I know there was a time when we may not have seen, um, our country may not have seen them as with the same level of reverence and importance, but we know better now. And so I'm trying to like um, correct that where I can. So with that, I'll, I'll pause. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing this most wonderful presentation with us and really all of your hard work and, and research that you've done thus far. And I'm sending you all my best as you continue to forge ahead to, to navigate research that sits before you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. So I know Dr. Birch and I have been tasked with some learning objectives. And so um, Dr. Birch, how might you want to sort of navigate this? Um, I know that the first um, learning objective that sort of speaks to what Mr. Mills was sharing with us today was to sort of take a look at um, some codes of ethics, right? Ethic codes in terms of how um, this may show up in the work that we're doing as counselors and counselors in training. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, I want to um, thank you for uh, keying up the question about ethics, but I also, you know, before I even begin to speak, um, want to also thank uh, Mr. Mills for um, the, the hard work and, and I just uh, continue to think about even uh, what, uh, I know how you got engaged in uh, this work, but what really compelled you kind of internally um, to keep moving and pushing through even despite those barriers. I think it speaks to um, the strength um, of knowing our stories and being able to kind of understand our identity um, and through um, this uh, historical context. Um, so, so many twists and turns and, and, and things that I was fascinated to, to hear about. <laughs> um, Dr. Dr. Davis, I, I think probably the easiest connection though that I could make to ethics um, speaks to you know, our uh, commitment as counselors to um, embrace multiculturalism, diversity, and, and, and as a part of that work, needing to understand ourselves. And so I think, again, Mr. Mills has done such a wonderful job of um, explaining um, how even his own kind of questions about who I am, how do I make an impact? How do I wanna show up in the world? Um, was at the um, kind of origin of, of all this uh, work in history that he uh, uncovered about his family. Um, and it told a story about your family, but it also told a story about us as a, as a nation um, and told a story about um, relationships uh, a, a, across culture and across time. So anyway, I'm, I'm just still so fascinated and thinking about how for us as counselors, um, so as, as mental health counselors, we need to be understanding our identity um, as well. Um, and that goes for um, obviously for um, end of counselors and individuals who are people of color, but also uh, for non-Black um, or Indigenous folks as well to understand what your identity and culture means and how it connects to this larger fabric um, so that you can be more prepared to hear the stories of others who are different from you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Dr. Birch. I think um, just in sort of hearing some of what you were sharing, what sort of um, stood out to me uh, as a counselor and as we sort of work with students who are counselors in training, um, yes, absolutely speaks to that multicultural diversity 
um, consideration that some of the, the ethics codes speak to. I also think about those personal values that we hold, right? And sort of making sure and ensuring that um, our values don't sort of um, bring about discriminatory, discriminatory types of behaviors, right? And, and paying very close attention to um, our attitudes and our beliefs and, and all of the behaviors that we exhibit, right? Um, when we listen to the narratives that people share with us um, and hold them sacred, um, hold them as sacred as possible um, while checking ourselves. Um, and you spoke right to it, Dr. Birch, in terms of knowing who we are and the importance and the, the meaning behind knowing who we are indeed. Um, I, I will say, right, like there's, listen, I can think of a code, section A, section B, section C, section E, right? When you think about the ACA code of ethics. So um, I encourage us all to continue to do our due diligence, to, to look at what thus says the codes of ethics as it relates to our behaviors, how we're responding to individuals who share these in-depth and very personal stories with us. Um, I can't again say thank you enough to, to Mr. Mills about um, the research that you've done and the due diligence that you've done um, is it's to be applauded. And that's, I mean, really, I, that's, I think we should do more than just applaud, but I'm grateful mm -hmm. for, for your presence here and your passion to show us that, um, you know, there are rabbit holes that we go down when we get excited about the research. You'll find yourself here and then find yourself going here. And if we as counselors or, or counselors in training can be that curious, Right, as we sort of go down those, um, those paths as we work alongside um, clients who tell stories, deeply personal stories, it's very important. Yeah. So. Yeah. Dr. Davis, if you don't mind, if I could riff a little bit, just because when you spoke to values, I was thinking, um, obviously, that relates to our understanding of, you know, our role and professional values. But I was also thinking about our program values, mm. uh, too, about uh, self-awareness and, um, you know, kind of being able to look at ourselves and even in the context of uh the counseling relationship to observe, you know, how we experience something that might be new, um, that might be, well, I don't want to, I don't want to um, prejudge how folks may have experienced uh, Mr. Mills's presentation, but as you're comfortable, um, I invite you, I, I would like to know how this landed on you. Mm. And so if you feel comfortable, either in the chat or in the document that Dr. Karoulis has provided, maybe just one or two words about what you observed happening in yourself as you listened to um, the, the, this story. Um, so this gives you an opportunity to just kind of look uh, internally um, to what was coming up for you as you were listening. Um, and that is a tool I think that we use as, as counselors, not only again, to get to know who we are, but also using our self-awareness to connect um, to our client. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Birch. That's a great suggestion. So if you feel led to, you can uh, respond to that prompt or, or maybe just think about it um, quietly to yourself. What did this feel like to listen to, um, to the story? May I, I share? May I, may, may I share? Uh, and Dr. Baptiste, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, John, if I could call you that. What a fabulous story. And I found myself, um, you know, doing my own little, I've never had um, such an intensive exploration into genealogy of my own background, but I found myself feeling a sense of loss, um, of knowledge to important histories, right? That would be important to who I am as a person. And I was particularly fascinated by your sense of, by, by the, I would say the temporal, the time dimensions. It's about me now, but it's about my ancestors. Um, this thought crystallized in my head as I was, as you were coming when you talked about Prince Mortimer. Um, every day, I would say, maybe not every day, I wouldn't say it hit my awareness every day, but certainly regularly, 
um, every couple of days, months, and so on. I am aware of, let's call it the shadow of chattel slavery in my own life. Colorism, representations in media I mean so many different ways, right? Things that we're still battling, and yet it could feel nameless and traceless. And that is a unique kind of pain for me because I know it exists because I feel it now, but yet others may not see it in the same way. Um, and I would say people of majority backgrounds may not understand that the history is the shadow of us. You know, like you're walking and you're seeing a shadow, it's there. And it isn't every day I feel it as a limitation. Sometimes I can even feel a sense of joy that I did not live in those days, but it's there every day. So I wanted to offer that as my own reflection. I live every day and when I reflect every, so, every couple often on the shadow of this history. I don't want it to be a limitation to me in my life currently. Like I wanna live in the modern age, but I don't wanna forget or have people deny the shadow of that in my life. So I offer that as my reflection today. And I'll stop that's, off camera and maybe others have their own. Thank you so much for that. that, that that's awesome. It, it's interesting when I was learning all of this stuff, um, I didn't, there was inter, it was personal to me because of how it affected me, but I never really saw it as just my, my history. Like I saw this as um, uh, the, an African-American history. Like if I found all this out, I just went with the assumption that if anyone did this research, they would come to the similar places, um, anyone you know, that's, uh, from African-American descent in this country. So I saw it as broader. So your, your comments um, are well taken. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Baptiste, for your willingness to share and, and be transparent with us about how it landed on you. One other response I'll just read from the anonymous comments was just the feeling uh, and how it hit home, how few generations have passed since slavery was in effect. And um, although, you know, the reason occasion for us gathering today is to um, hear this wonderful presentation and to um, recognize Juneteenth, but we're just now uh, beginning to um, in a collective way, um, unpack and make sense of um, the legacy of um, chattel slavery. And so I, um, I really appreciate um, that, that, that thought about connecting across time um, to the experiences of those who, who came before us. Thank Absolutely. you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, Dr. Burgess, you were sharing um, some of what you were reading in the anonymous piece. I think what what struck me in terms of the correlation, um, like when I think about slavery and how that sort of impacts us today, um, I'm wondering, um, and, and you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about sort of how we are seeing this impact us today, uh, not just in the work that we're doing, but in in society as a whole, right? When we think about slavery and how, how it's been sort of made manifest and, and how we are experiencing um, working with folks today as counselors or counselors in training. You know, one of the things, and I'll just, I'll just jump right out here and say it. Um, you know, I think about um, the fact that historical and, and generational, um, you know, trauma is real, right? And I think about how we are all impacted. I think about, um, there's, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, and it talks a lot about trauma and how um, generational and, and um, you know, historical trauma impacts us in the many ways that it can. And um, much like you did today, Mr. Mills, in terms of um, really being vulnerable to do your research, to, to share what you've uncovered with us about your own family lineage, as well as how Prince Mortimer's life, um, you know, seemed to still be unfolding right to us in terms of some of the information that still escapes us to this day. I think it's so important for us as counselors and counselors in training to, um, I would say it behooves us actually to um, do our own due diligence, right? To understand who we are as racial beings, to understand how um, our historical and generational 
um, lived experiences and familial lines, if you will, um, have impacted us today. And I preface that with saying that it's it's likely, highly unlikely that we'll, we'll start digging today and come away with the plethora of answers that we hope to have, but with patience that um, such as what Mr. Mills has, has sort of shared with us, the patience and the tenacity and the resilience mm -hmm. that it takes to really continue to do our due diligence, to just understand who we are and, and really understand the people that we're working with and, and, and believe folks when they tell you um, that they've experienced, you know, what they've experienced, right? And, and really understand that even while people can experience the same type of trauma, from a clinical standpoint, we all experience and respond to trauma differently, mm -hmm. right? And so really sort of being sure that we're well aware of, of um, that concept as well in our work and in, in our quest to do the, the best kind of work possible. Dr. Davis, may I add a question from our anonymous document? Of course. Okay, this is for the whole panel. And then I have another question um, afterwards for John. So the question slash comment is, as I was listening and it, it inspired me to explore my identity as an African-American woman, I've always wanted to learn more about my roots, especially as I get older and I grow as a counselor. My family, such as my grandparents, would be a great starting point, but other research would need to be done to learn aspects outside of my family's knowledge. It also made me think of how I can bring this inspiration and curiosity to my students and my clients. What would be the first steps for that exploration and growth? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't wanna jump over you, Dr. Birch. I, I've got some thoughts and I certainly, I think I've been talking enough and wanna open the floor to Dr. Birch this year and I can certainly share my thoughts as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that if uh, Mr. Mills's example tells us anything that there probably will be lots of twists and turns and there is no linear path. Right. Um, and so it's hard to say, you know, um, exactly the steps that you uh, might take. I think it, the first step is really just to, to get started and, and maybe begin to talk to relatives that are um, still um, with you and your family if you have them, because we do know that so much is, is passed on the, the, our, the person who asked the question or, you know, is, is from African American background so much is passed on through oral history. And so being able to hear those stories firsthand from what people um, remember, I, I would imagine that that would be a beginning part of the um, discovery, but again, that, 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 that road may twist and turn and, um, the roadblocks, um, I think that even Mr. Mills just dis discovered along the way, um, can sometimes be, be frustrating. I, I can share a personal, uh, re re reaction I had when you started talking about, um, that, you know, they needed you to produce some documentation and at the same time, you knew that there had been active um, kind of an a, a active and willful lack of documentation of um, people who were enslaved. And so, you know, this kind of catch 22 about um, ways that we know and find truth, um, you know, get, get, get compl complicated and they are definitely colored uh, I guess probably pun intended by oppression and racism um, that have, um, you know, kind of thwarted those those efforts to know more about your identity. So I I, I don't know that I've been very helpful <laughs> in terms of first steps, but just kind of giving you a little bit of um, my own um, kind of reaction to what I learned from Mr. Mills and his experience. Mm, that's a great point. Go for the it, things, Mr. The things that helped me and my sister most was she was, she had the foresight to in the late eighties and early nineties to start interviewing people that shortly after passed. And, and she just was really smart with that. And we didn't use that information and, you know, until 10, 15 years after, but she was just very insightful. And so 
we had a starting place. Like we, we could go look at video or listen to audio tapes where they were being asked very direct and specific questions about their parents, their grandparents, what they remembered about their experiences. Um, so I would offer um, kind of similar uh, to Dr. Burst is to um, get, get with your grandparents. I'm sure there are things that they're not telling you because it just doesn't come to mind until you ask the pointed question, right? And record that. Come ready with a video camera and a, and a tape recorder because 20 years from now, that's gonna be invaluable to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, great suggestions. Thank you, panel. And Mr. Mills, this is a question directly for you. It is kind of um, a long set of questions. So as you absorb it and give responses, if you'd like me to repeat anything, uh, please let me know. How do you think your unconscious biases changed during your process of genealogical investigation in particular? Additionally, what emotions came forward for you as you experienced incredibly salient instances of racism, obvious within your family's lineage and the very preservation of its history, especially during your experiences with death segregation? Well, to the first part of that question, I, I really didn't see um, bias in a way that was unconscious other than to my, in, in my own experience with it in the early 90s. Like when I would see bias that was external, I just saw it as bias. Like I, I saw it as a very intentional and direct. And this stuff gave me a completely different perspective. I, I've had conversations with some of um, the slaveholders descendants that are my relatives now, but they're white Americans. And they're, how they communicate with me is very uncomfortable, very defensive of their family, not quite sure how to respond. I, I, I guess I've grown into the idea of the unconsciousness of it and grown a different level of grace and an understanding of the complexity of it. That's what all this taught me, like, right. But again, when I was younger, when we're talking the eighties and nineties, I didn't see it that way. I found in myself that it was unconscious, but externally, I, I took it as direct and intentional, but this research kind of gave me more grace to, it's a deeper thing, right? Um, how it affected um, me beyond that, like as I find things, it, it just makes me want to correct them. You know, because I assume there's going to be somebody, my, you know, I have a granddaughter and her kids that someday, they're going to be looking to do something like this or her kids, kids. And it just made me think, I don't want them to go doing this and there's not a stone or go to find a documentation and it's not there. Like if I can figure out how to get something and just have it more organized and presented, and even not just to my own family, whomever, if I could figure out how to, you know, uh, start some type of movement towards that, maybe it will help others in the future. And maybe they come to similar kind of conclusions as I, more grace, more understanding of the complexity, more understanding of who they are. Like, so that's all it um, really did. Yeah, you get angry sometimes, but ultimately <laughs> that's been my, my, my take away from it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the, um, what I heard you say about wanting to, um, leave a stone for someone else to turn over um, in the future. And it just makes me think about um, something that I wanted to make sure to be able to share today is about how um, identity work for black people, if you're thinking from a, uh, a, a lens of black psychology, that the being able to connect and analyze your own identity is a hallmark in, in black psychology of being able uh, to, to have your own kind of mental wellness and to achieve liberation. So um, again, it's been beautiful to watch you describe how you did this uh, very in-depth um, search and understanding for your identity. And then you have the sensitivity to say, and, and people who come behind me may want to go on this journey. This may be a part of work that they need to do for their own healing. 
and for their own um, mental wellness and liberation and that you're leaving um, this, this work and legacy uh, to them. That's a great point, Dr. Birch. Mr. Mills, please feel free if you want to share. Yeah, no, I was just going to thank you for those words. Yeah, and I'm hopeful that it's, a, it's of some value to, you know, later generations. Um, and, and also, um, I'm hopeful that some of the markers, especially um, uh, this new one in the town of Weathersfield for Prince Mortimer, uh, the, you know, the older gentleman walking by and reading it, it has some type of additional ripple effect to just the, uh, you know, the locals that pass by and read this, right? Um, so uh, uh, that's that's my hope. We'll we'll see. No doubt, no doubt that your hard work will will pay off and be a, a sort of a, a beacon of light um, for those who are coming behind you. Yeah, the 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 the, the individual that I I met with in. Um, Texas again. She her 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 lineage was the slave old holder of the Kyle family, and and um, yeah, she. Uh, but I I could kind of understand like you know uh, she 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 very defensive of this position, of you know that her family you know, committed these things that she sees as atrocities. So in in it's hard to just have a, a fact based conversation because I'm also kind of trying to tiptoe around how her how it makes her feel, right? Um, so there's a dynamic in that that I recognized when while we were in Texas um, that, you know, you know, I'm just trying to uh, unearth truths. Whereas from her perspective, it, there's an element of slander to the name, right? In her and her vision and her view of it, while she understands like the the need, like so, and you can see that wheel processing, right? Like as we're like having these conversations, um, so that's been an experience of mine as well. It's it's been a journey. It's been interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, don't give up the fight. I know that there's still a long way to go, right? According to what you've shared with us today, but uh, don't give it up. Yeah. You've inspired Absolutely. me and I imagine you've inspired others um, that this is what some of the work can look like, right? Um, Dr. Burge talked a little bit about, you know, being able to um, become familiar with yourself as a racial being and what this identity development work sort of look like. And, um, you know, it could, it could look different for many of us for many reasons, right, in terms of starting points and, and our whys in terms of what it is that we're trying to uncover and why. Um, and so I just, I wanted to say thank you again, Mr. Mills, for your, your willingness to give us a real concrete example of what that work looks like um, and that it is ever ongoing, ever evolving, right, and that there isn't really an end point, um, mm -hmm. but just yet another sort of stone to uncover. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate those words. Absolutely. There was one other uh, piece in the question that Dr. Karulis read um, about death segregation. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I really, um, one of the reasons why I'm picking that thread back up is because it was one of the things that really stood out for me too, and um, it, it, it seemed like a, a very um, kind of poignant uh, example of, of, of institutional oppression and racism. Again, it, in that it was a barrier to your, um, uh, you know, re your research, and it was, um, you know, another level of, um, of uh, disrespect and, 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 um, a not showing dignity to um, formerly enslaved or, or even um, black or people of color um, in, in death. But I wondered if um, you had any other examples of things that you ran across that you feel like um, really uh, kind of showcased 
some of the historical and, and, and legacies of, of, of oppression and racism. Yeah, I mean, and the, 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 just to go back to that, yeah, the, there was definitely, um, it was painful when in, in verse uncovering that. Um, now I, uh, you know, that was years ago now, our first kind of instance of discovering that was 2004. But in 2004, when, it, when I saw the reality of it, and it wasn't like a movie or a book, you know, it wasn't some novel I was reading. It was my, it was my great grandmother. And so, and so there was a, there was a personal element to it. So it was painful that day. Um, and it took years to kind of process, but now it's, it's, I see it as very, it was the norm. Like that was, you know, that was the, the, the way of the day, right? And so, um, and it helped me kind of align to um, how their descendants uh, operated in life, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it, it made me realize that their children, which would have been my grandparents, but what they were facing um, in, 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 in life in East Texas, it made me realize, you know, part of the story my grandfather got to California because he he got into this interracial um, relationship in the in the uh, late 20s early 30s and there were threats on his life he was threatened to be hung so that's how he got to California he had to get out of there so we started you know, I started in talking to people I started hearing the stories and the things that you know aligned to things I would only read or see in TV or movies um, and so the core things being the, the segregation in the cemeteries, the lack of documentation pre-1865, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the core things. It all, it all aligned pretty much around that. I could get back to a slave schedule prior to 1865, but those were just numbers. Mm -hmm. And there were only two decades I could even find those. And prior to that, I really couldn't find anything. Um, and, uh, and even in the North, that, that surprised me is that there were commonalities to that same kind of context in the South. And I had never been taught that. Like my, my, mm -hmm. my brain had it as if like there were these kind of stark distinctions. And no, there were like very common things in both um, areas. So I guess to answer your question, those were the two main things. It was like yeah. government documentation around census documents and that segregation of the cemeteries and how, what types of stones you know, there, because there was an, you know, a gap with regards to, you know, wealth and inequ inequity, equities, as it relates to the fact they were just kind of freed, mm -hmm. they, they didn't really have the money to create anything that would last. So a lot of, even if they had a marker, most of those would weather it away. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, those were the type of things I, I kept finding. And I had to rely now on passed down stories, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, interview, interviews, um, family documentation that existed at, in the whole, the slaveholder, right? Like, like I had to kind of divert to the slaveholder's family and then hope they had documentation mm -hmm. about the slave they owned mm -hmm. or in a Bible or, or some marking, uh, in, right? Um, so yeah, those were the, those were the things I learned. That's just no, I was just gonna note that I, I could hear it in the tone in your voice, um, Mr. Mills, how difficult it was for you to find that. And again, something that we don't take lightly, um, your willingness to be vulnerable with us and share with us, um, you know, the excitement uh, of what you found, but also the pain and sadness and uh, anger in terms of what you found as well. So I just I just wanted to circle back to to what I'm picking up as well. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Yeah. And 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 Dr. Davis, I was going to say a very very similar thing that they on the surface are facts, historical yeah. facts that are being discovered, but in the present moment have a, tre a tremendous impact, emotional impact, um, when when we engage. Um, this this history 
and unpack it. And I think that that goes for anybody um, who, who can honestly, and, and as you said, vulnerably uh, really engage um, the, the, the history of uh, enslaved people, the history of our, of our nation. Um, really important. One, la one last story. Like the, the one thing that's still kind of burned in my brain, right? It's like, it's, I'll never forget it is um, that 2004 walk out of Hickory Grove Cemetery down this lightly woven path to go into the woods. Like, like as I was walking it, I was thinking, okay, in 1918, my great aunts and uncles were carrying, you know, this coffin and they were also walking the same lightly driven path, looking at this pristine cemetery to their left to walk in the woods. Like that, that impressed upon me, like what were their thoughts in knowing they had to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, the journey has uh, been emotional, a lot, a lot of locations, but that one, like, it's burned into my brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how that just really demonstrates that again, um, these psychological and emotional experiences transcend an individual experience to a more collective uh, experience where there is intentional and meaningful connection with ancestors and um, the meaning of their lives on your life. And, and in some, you know, th this is um, uh, kind of defies, de defies time your life is impacting their life. Because when you talked about that, that marker for Prince Mortimer, I was thinking, wow, this in, in some ways, would that be redemptive for, you know, how he was portrayed in this book? Um, but that when you're looking at it through your eyes, through your experience and connection to your family, there is a, a different narrative to be, to be told. And I imagine not only is that redemptive for, um, again, the legacy for Prince Mortimer, but that there's some healing in that uh, maybe for you, maybe for us. I certainly felt lighter thinking about that being a potential outcome of, of all your work. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely, um, I see it in that way. Like there, I, I, I definitely uh, have um, a sense of uh, joy about just the fact that there will be something that's there that tells a different narrative. So there is de in, in definitely a, a level of healing for me um, in knowing that that's gonna come to fruition. Uh, Dr. Spooch and Davis, I wonder if you'll allow me to just, um, as we wrap up to just give a note of thanks, uh, just real a shout out and thank you um, to the people that have organized this. Mr. Mills, this is a fabulous, a very unique narrative. It's just more than a narrative, an exploration that we're engaging with you and keep up the good work on this. It's been fun to talk about it. Um, and touch parts of your life, but also our own, right? And I wanna thank Drs. Davis and Birch for guiding a very, there's a lot of tenderness here today, right? A lot of um, maybe old pain, but also hope, you know, about our future. And um, Dr. Karoulis, um, I want to acknowledge you. Can you pop on screen, Michelle? Um, as the person that thought that counseling at Northwestern, we should do our own celebration of Juneteenth. As the, uh, as the federal government um, has finally decided to honor um, the history of black people in the United States, the diaspora to be honest, mm -hmm. um, around such a consequential event in our evolution and history. Yeah. So um, I leave you with these words. Um, Soren Kierkegaard is a fabulous philosopher, I think you know, is a theologian. And he said these things, he said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. So we remember what happened to th things that happened to us and what we lost, but it's really about the future also, right? And so that is a struggle for each of us in our own evolution. And I think 
a holiday does that for us. Uh, a, a, a note of memory to look forward, but it also mean be, it also would be our journey in our own personal lives. So thank you very much for doing this for us today. Panelists, thank you very much. Dr. Karoulis, thank you for being the initiator of this great event. And 